I, um, I was telling the folks from Farazi Greenlight who came down here today that uh, you probably have defined um, for almost a generation before we ever came onto the landscape everything that we believe in. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> what a blessing it is to be here in front of you and with you and have this dialogue. Um, I mean, to have the One Minute Manager having sold 13 million copies, um, to be one of the top 25 best-selling authors, period, <laughs> right? Um, that's uh, quite an accomplishment. And the impact that this man has made on our lives, whether we know it or not, has been extraordinary. Uh, and his gift of servant leadership to the world. Um, I was so touched by the book and, and so excited by it because I try to live it as much as I can. Mm -hmm. How do you turn the relationships in your life into coaching opportunities through this principle of mentoring? And so much of my life and my success has been defined by great people. Mm -hmm. um, and what I love about the book is that you, you make it such a broad and easily accessible um, idea. I mean, your use of parables and the storytelling and the great examples, etc. So first of all, we can end we can begin with the end in mind, which is please buy this book. Um, you'd love it. It's easy to read. It's fun. It's <clears> going to be a, a great opportunity for you personally. What, what would your vision be for the, this book's success a month or so from now when everybody's got it in their hands? Well, Keith, <clears throat> before we get into that, I just thought uh, uh, the wonderful thing about this book is Claire Diaz Ortiz, is, she's about 34 years old, and <clears throat> she was one of the first employees with Twitter. She wrote a book called Twitter for Good. She got the Pope to tweet. She was in the New York Times. And <clears throat> she came to me and said, Ken, in the past, mentors have always been older yeah. than you. And I think that uh, us youngins could learn a lot from older people. But you older folks could learn a lot from us younger folks, particularly around technology. And so uh, the focus is really on uh, the fact that if you're a mentor or a mentee, both of you learn. And that was just a <clears throat> wonderful yeah. thing for me. And, and I hadn't really thought about the power of that, but you know, Keith mentioned I wrote 60 books, and my mother always said, why don't you write a book by yourself? You know, I've only, only written two by myself, one on golf. So many people were trying to help my golf game. I didn't know who to write it with. And then the second is my spiritual journey, and I didn't... Oh, by the way, golf and God are not two... They're, they're two pretty good subjects, right? Well, God created golf, you know. <laughs> <coughs> Just to test your patience well, and your spirituality. Well, golf spells game of life first. Got it. And uh, so, but... Uh, so all the other ones I've written with other people, and, uh, and I hadn't thought about uh, what a powerful thing is, because some cases I mentored <coughs> a younger person, and other times... Like I wrote a book with Norman Vincent Peale. He was 86 years old when I met. He wrote The Power of Positive Thinking. I was like 42. And uh, what an amazing man. And get to know Norman and his wife, Ruth, who died a couple of years ago at 101. Uh, and, can, uh, can you're a unique man in that your humility and the way you approach the world is, um, is, uh, is, is a real blessing. But for many of us, the ability to enter into a relationship with somebody that presumably is our mentee, and at the same time to open up the vulnerability of our willingness to learn and grow from them. What advice do you have uh, for folks on that mutual learning journey where it, it may not come as naturally to be uh, that vulnerable and that open to the people around us? Well, one of my beliefs, and I remember Norman and I talked about it, is if, if, if you stop learning, you might as well lie down and let them put the dirt on you, you know, because you're dead anyway. Uh, and so that's really the exciting thing is having that attitude of learning. And, and learning is, doesn't happen just by talking. Like one of the things we found in our seminar and our work is that, that the person that does the most talking does the most learning. And that's why we always try to make sure that we'll make a point and then we have people say, what did you hear and what does it mean to you? talk to your neighbors, even if I'm doing a, a keynote, because people really need to get involved in the learning if they're going to learn. And uh, <clears throat> so I think that's the, the exciting thing. And, and part of learning is to share who you are. You know, a lot of times people say, God, you really share a lot about, about your, because uh, that's the way I, way I learn. 
and uh, that uh, I was telling Keith I wrote a book with Colleen Barrett, who became president of Southwest Airlines after Herb Keller, who founded it, decided to step down. And she had never, didn't have a major leadership position before that. She did some work in customer service, but her biggest role was she was Herb's executive secretary, you know, for over 25 years. And uh, Herb is a big believer in servant leadership, see, and which is, if I was going to leave any legacy, I'd really leave that because the, the world is in desperate need of a different leadership role model. We've seen what self-serving leaders have done in every sector of society uh, and all. And a lot of people, when I talk about servant leadership, they think I'm talking about the inmates running the prison or trying to please people. No, Keith, it's the only way to get great results and great human relationships. Well, but, but, to that, but to that end, yeah. the servant leadership embedded in the mentoring yes. is obviously crucial. Yes, yeah. but, but talk a little bit about the awakening that people have to go through to need it. Your character, Josh, fought yeah. the original awakening that, that he could create a mentoring relationship with a peer of his that Eva, his boss, had suggested. Yeah. Um, so many of us need that awakening to realize that we need to go on this journey. Can you speak a little bit about that awakening? Yeah, I just want to finish the other point, though, as I was making with, uh, with Colleen, you know, and, and uh, with servant leadership, there's two parts of it. There's the leadership part, vision and direction and goals. People got to know where you're going. And, and that's a responsibility of the hierarchy. It doesn't mean you don't involve people. But then you get to the servant part, which is where you turn the pyramid upside down, mm -hmm. and now you work for the people. And Herb didn't want to have some outsider come in and change the vision and values. He wanted somebody who was naturally did the servant part. And so he said, Colleen, you be president. And one of Colleen's favorite sayings that I was mentioning to you is that people admire your skills, but they love your vulnerability. Yeah. And a lot of times people think that if in a mentoring relationship, right, you kind of share some of your concerns and your worries, that, that that's going to look bad on you. No, people, they already know you're not perfect. And when you share, you know, your concerns and all, wow, you go up in their mind, and now they can be real with you, too. And I, I think that that's such an important uh, aspect of, of learning is that it's a two-way process, but uh, people aren't going to really learn from you if you're, if you're like this, you know. And uh, so, but in terms of, of finding a mentor, you know, the first thing is the intention that you ought to have one. Here, this young character in the book, Josh, is in sales, and he did all right in the beginning, but he's really flat now, and he's wondering what he ought to do, and his you know, father says, you ought to get a mentor, and he said, well, you know, where would I get one? He said, well, first of all, have the intention, and then tell people you're looking for somebody who might be able to mentor you, and you'll be amazed at the opportunities might, that might come uh, your way. Uh, and, but there's an important thing, uh, Keith, when you're thinking about a mentoring relationship. A friend of mine said, if you're going to have a relationship with somebody else, there's two parts. One is essence, and the other is form. Essence is heart to heart and values to values. And form <coughs> is what are you going to do together? And I have found over the years, every time I jump to form, and miss making sure there's essence, essence bites me in the tail, you know? And so, like, people say, how do you choose an author? Well, the first time is I spend time with them to see if we're in the same ballpark in terms of values and vision and, and all that kind of thing. And then we can talk about form. Like, give you an example of, of that. Uh, I had an idea of writing a book called The Power of Positive Management. And so I went to a a guy who was really well known for positive thinking and all that. And all he wanted to do was talk about form. Who's going to do what? How are we going to divide the royalties, you know, and all this kind of thing. So I decided to pass. And so our publisher uh, called and said, I heard you were disappointed in your meeting. Have you ever thought about writing a book with Norman Vincent Peale? And I said, is he still alive? You know, I mean, <laughs> my parents had gone to his church before I was born. And uh, they said, now he's alive. He's amazing. So I went to New York and I spent a three-hour lunch with Norman and and, and our publisher and all. And in three hours, Keith, there was not one mention of form. It was all essence. They said, tell, tell, tell us about yourself. And 
and uh, let us tell you about who we are and where we're coming from. And at the end of the lunch, Norman turned to Ruth and asked the ultimate essence. We hadn't even decided what we would write about if we wrote together. Uh, he said, Ruth, do you think we should write this book with this young man? <laughs> and she said, absolutely, under one condition. He said, what's that? From now on, he will bring his wife, Margie, and the four of us will work on it together, because they heard all kinds of great things about my wife, Margie. I, I married way above myself. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> And so, uh, but that was really, it. and then we started, first time it was form. What, what, what are we going to do if we did the thing? And that's, that's really, imp and so Josh has some people that are potential mentors, but he, when he meets with them and has lunch with them, it just doesn't feel right. Yeah. And uh, so that's really uh, interesting. What, what I like about the book is that it does a beautiful job of putting form to essence as well, yeah. though. I mean, it gives some good guidelines and advice on how do you navigate some of those more difficult early conversations, some structure around it. I mean, frankly, just recognizing that you don't dive into structure before you get the connection, that that's that right. trust and connection is first, that in a sense is form applied to essence. That's right, and I love yeah. the fact that the book does that beautifully. Yes. That search process, so the book takes you through a search process. How does one go about finding those right mentors, the types of mentors that you can, um, that you can find in your life? The, um, you know, I, it was interesting because Josh was resistant early on. Yes. And I, I worry, I don't know how many folks in here, um, probably if you're here, you're not a resistant learner. But in our lives, we see resistant learners all the time. People who aren't mm -hmm. um, willing to be vulnerable enough to open themselves up for learning. That's right, yeah. How do you get through to those resistant learners to open them on the path to this kind of informal learning pathway of finding the, the coaching around us that exists? Well, I, I think you have to reach out to them. You know, one of the biggest questions, I, Keith, I get, how do you make an impact on a top manager who's not very open and right. is kind of self-serving? Well, I said, you know, human relations is like money in a bank. That any time you give somebody feedback, you know, like, you know, get a life, you know, you, you, you ought to be a learner. <clears throat> You're going to take something from that relationship if you don't have anything in the bank, you better have a mask and a gun, see? And so I always say to people- The before, mask and the gun is authority. Yeah, that's right. right. I always say to people, if, if you want to give somebody feedback, you better first have, first have a relationship uh, with them. I remember uh, one of my teaching, I taught for 10 years, they had brought in a new dean, and he, he wrote a bunch of wonderful books on participative management. That wasn't his style at all, you know? I mean, it was my way or the highway. <clears throat> and so some of the faculty members would charge into his office and give him f feedback, and he'd throw them out, you know? And so I said, I got to first get a relationship with him. So I met him in the hall, and I said, George, you're, you know, you're really a good writer. I'm working on an article, because this was early in my career. Would, could I send it to you? Would you read it? And could you give me some feedback? Oh, absolutely, you know? So I met him in his office. He had flip charts, and <clears throat> he was going to give me all kinds of advice. And I met him two or three times about writing. And finally, he said to me, Ken, what do you think we should do with the jerks in this, in this college? The key word is, what should we do? Why, I'm on his team now. Yeah. So I was able to give him some feedback you know, about what he could do in relation to what other people to do. And I, and I well, think What was important. interesting about that is the, the mechanism that you used to engage in us, the creation of us, yes. was asking for feedback. That's right. So it's interesting. I mean, that was your generosity. That was your yeah. currency. You had yeah. to, and, and certain people asking for that feedback um, does open them up to sure. then all of a sudden ask for it themselves. That's right. Which I think is so but important. Some people are afraid of feedback, you know, and I've always felt that feedback is the breakfast of champions. Mm. You know, I mean, how are you going to be good at anything? If by, the way, by the way, for all of you tweeting, that is a tweetable moment, right? <laughs> well, that's an opportunity. And because uh, it really is, you know, and uh, but you got to open yourself up uh, for it, that, that's uh, really true. And sometimes I think it's, it's modeling it, you know? And so since I'm a little older, if I model being vulnerable, then I can invite younger people to say, yeah. wow, I, I appreciate that, uh, Ken, you know? And, uh, and, and then that mutual learning starts. I wanna uh, just reinforce the importance of this book. We did a research study about four years ago and um, we identified that one of the greatest crises in, in organizations today is what's drying up is informal learning. Informal learning is that coaching that you get from your leaders and managers 
And unless you're a client of the Blanchard Company um, that does beautiful coaching, then most likely your managers are not giving the kind of coaching that they need to be. Managers are not giving the kind of coaching that they used to and that they need to because of a lot of different reasons. So what I love about this book is it unleashes the coaching that's available to us all around. But I do want to stop for a moment. Um, you make a distinction between coaching and mentoring. Mm -hmm. Can you, can you um, dig into that a little bit? Well, coaching really is about helping you accomplish a specific kind of goal. You know, it's, it's, it's more specific. Where mentoring is more of the big picture about where you're going with your life and you know, what are your values and things like that. I mean, the, the same uh, style of listening and asking good questions and all the, the you know, coaching uh, essentials are, are key there, but mentoring is more of a, of a big picture than a coaching. We have a, a big coaching network that works with our company and they're working with CEOs and other people on how they can get better at what they're, they're doing, but they don't, it's not in about you know, where are they going with their life and all that kind of thing. I, I think if you're wondering, God, I'm not sure what the next step in my life is or where I should go, you know, it's, a, it's, it's really say, well, maybe you ought to, you ought to find a, a mentor, you know. It's a, and it's so interesting. I think it's so stupid, Keith, that companies will kick people out at 65 or what have you. I would keep them on, even if it's just part-time, to mentor younger uh, people because we find that a lot of, you know, 60, 70 percent of first-time managers fail because no, nobody's mentoring them, nobody's training them, and, and uh, what, what valuable uh, things they could get. And then the young people, what I found working with Claire, could help these older people get more out of the rest of their life. I wrote a book recently called Refire, Don't Retire. Make the rest of your life the best of your life, you know what I mean? And so I, I think you, you, know, uh, you need to keep learning. I, when I turned 65, I was on the phone with Zig Ziglar, the old motivation guy. He had invited Margie and I to the 59th anniversary of his 21st birthday. And uh, so I said, Ziggy, you going to retire? He said, there's no mention of it in the Bible. He said, except for Jesus, Mary, and David, hardly un anybody under 80 made an impact. I'm refiring, not retiring. And I thought that was really great, and I actually dedicated the book to, to, to uh, Zig because he died a, a year or so ago. But but that, that's such a powerful uh, thing about, you know, opening yourself to, to learning. And, and one of the most amazing mentoring jobs is what? It's a parent. And those of you parents, if, if, have you ever learned anything from your kids? <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just a, just a wonderful opportunity to, uh, to, to do that. I mean, it's just so... But I think it, it gets... Down, Keith, that's why I was love us to be together because, you know, when you're said, talking about never eat alone, you know, you're saying what the most important thing in life is about relationships, yeah. you know, and I think that's really true. If you want to continue to grow as an individual, you need to grow your relationships and reach out to learn from, from uh, different I've, people. I've always, I've always thought that relationships, when, when Never Eat Alone was written, the intention originally was to talk about how your network made opportunities available to you. But then as I really dug into the topic of relationships, I learned that relationships really are your, your fuel for personal growth and professional growth, not just opportunity. So it's not just the opportunities and jobs, but actually the growth and development, which was what I loved about sure, yeah. the excitement about uh, of talking to you about this book. Talk a little bit about the mentoring model. Uh, maybe we can move to structure just a little bit. Yes, uh, Claire came up with this model. It's an acronym, MENTOR. We, I love acronyms anyway, but M stands for mission, which is once you start a relationship, the first question you ought to is, what do we both want to get out of this? You know, Because I, I, I think that what's the first secret of the one-minute manager? One-minute goal setting. You know, And so if you don't know where you want to go with a relationship, you're probably not going to get there. You know, so M says, you know, what are we trying to get out of this? And then E is engagement, which is how do we want to interact? How often, you know? Is, does it always have to be face-to-face -face or can we do some online or Skype, you know? I mean, so, you know, Claire, living down in Argentina, we, 
did a lot of you know, distance stuff besides getting together face to face. So you have to agree on how you want to meet. And then what you, what you love, Ann, is network, which is one of the key things about a mentoring relationship is both of you have a network of people and, and all that you can kind of share with you. Have you ever thought about talking to this person? Right. That, you know, I think you'd really get something out of, uh, out of this, and so that's so important. And then T is, is just a whole area that's so important, uh, Keith, which is trust. You know, we, we ended up, a, a good friend of mine, a colleague, uh, uh, been studying trust for, for uh, you know, 20 years, and we ended up writing a, a, a book together on uh, Trust Works. Uh, but um, what, what she really found in her research is that there's a lot of people have a different definition of trust. And, uh, and she, she really, uh, her name is Cindy Olmsted. She's just an amazing... So uh, A, and she said A, B, C, D of trust. A is, uh, does the person have the ability and the skills that you're counting on mm -hmm. in that thing? So first of all, you, you trust their knowledge and their skills. Uh, B is, are they believable? You know, do they say one thing and they, you know, my, my door's always open, come to see me, and then they got three secretaries you got to go through, you know, and they got this huge mahogany desk that they sit behind, you know. They're not very believable. Uh, C is what we're talking about, connectedness, you know, the, the essence, the heart, the heart, you know, do you, because, you know, one of the things in our company, our hiring strategy is that when you hire somebody to work in our company, if when they walk through the door the first day, if you don't feel a chemical difference in your body, because you're glad to see them. Why the hell did you hire them? There's enough jerks in the world. We don't need them working for us, you know? And, uh, and so it's that, that connectedness thing. And then D stands for dependable. You know, the dependable. If, if you say, you know, let's meet next Thursday, do, do they show up? You know, can you, can you count on uh, them? And so uh, mentoring relationships are building that trust, which over time then permits you to even yeah. be more vulnerable. Uh, and uh, so the uh, O ha stands for opportunities, you know, which is different than networks because you might say, gee, have you ever looked into this? I understand, you know, so in the book it talks about, you know, uh, big brothers, big sisters. I don't know if you've all been involved in that, but that is such an incredible organization. We now have over 20 women in our company who are mentoring uh, little sisters. And they come and, over. And what a great mutual learning journey oh that is. Oh my God, yeah. they, they bring them over in a bus once every two weeks for three hours. And I tell you, our people have learned so much from these young kids. And, and you should see how this helped turn around their belief. My editor is the gal that's working with her. I mean, she was into drugs. She was into all kinds of problems. She got all A's last year, you know? I mean, it's just, and she just turned, when her mother, sees my editor coming to, to pick up her daughter, she starts to cry right away, you know? And just, oh, I don't know, you've just been so, it's just such, but it's, why, why, she says, oh my God, are you kidding me? I've, I've learned, uh, learned so much about that. So it's just, uh, so looking for opportunities where you can do, and then R is review uh, and uh, to, you know, re, uh, ignition or reignite because you always want to have a period of time where you say, how well did we do? Do we want to continue? And, and all that kind of thing. And so that's, uh, that's really true. You know, like I've written all these books and, uh, but some I've written several books with. And those are people who I have a really special relationship because we'll finish one and we'll say, well, what else could we do together? You know, like Sheldon Bowles, I wrote Raving Fans with an amazing guy from Canada. Uh, and then we ended up following and writing Gun Ho, you know, because people say, how do you create raving fan customers if your people feel unmotivated? And so it's, uh, so the, the mentor model is just a nice framework for you to, th to think about as you develop a, a mentoring relationship. And boy, think about that in terms of parenting, you know. What, you, what is your hope and your dream for your kids? You know, have you ever thought about that? You know, do you, 
do, do you have a mission? Do you have a set of values that you want them uh, to follow? You know? I'm going to take a crazy, uh, maybe comparative analysis here. So you have, you've had uh, 60 children um, in the books that you've created. Yeah. And you've co-parented them almost uh, entirely with other individuals. Um, what kind of comparisons, what have you learned as a partner? Because so much of business today is about partnership. Um, what have you learned as a partner in birthing something as important as your writing? I mean, yeah. that, is your, that is your legacy, and yet mm -hmm. you've consistently been able to partner with other people in coming up with genius works that are birthed by you. I mean, that's, that, that's a very unique skill. Well, I, th I think the big thing, Keith, and I think you believe in this too, is I believe that one plus one is a lot greater than two. And I, I think that uh, when you realize that maybe you don't have all the answers, <laughs> then, then you're really open to, to learn. And that's what's just been so exciting in all my, my 70th birthday, I invited all my co-authors to come and over 50 of them showed up for a day and a half of, of we had panels and everything talking about what we've all learned. And it was just fun because a lot of them hadn't met each other, you know, and people were bringing, uh, you know, footballs for Don Shula, the Miami coach, to, to sign, you know, and the whale trainers I worked with were, were there and people were all excited about, about that and Spencer Johnson and, you know, you know it, just, it was just uh, kind of fun. But it's, it's that, uh, I think that's, willing that you don't have everything together in your life. You know, you're, you know, you're, you're not a finished product yet. Well, I mean, <laughs> your, your belief system that none of us are ever a finished product, and what I think, um, not only the book, but Ken's life, he's really built an ecosystem of beautiful relationships that he's grown with, they've grown, and together they've created greatness for others. And I mean, what a beautiful analogy for all of us to live our lives as professionals, right? I mean, the ability for all of us to decide today that we're going to begin to cultivate beautiful partnerships mm -hmm. in service of the mission of our lives and our work, in service of each other, and to live in joy through those relationships. And I mean, imagine, imagine that day, you know, on his 70th birthday and 50 people show up, all of whom have created greatness in the world, and he's done that as a, as a community. And I think that really is a great... Um, analogy for how all of us should live our lives. Yeah, and you and I talked a little bit about this, is that Peter Drucker told me years ago, nothing good happens by accident. And if you want a great relationship, put some structure on it. <clears throat> so, like, I love this concept of date night with couples. You know, I mean, you look at the divorce rate in this country, and you're saying, my God, that's ridiculous. You know, I mean, what, what's going on? And with date night is, the concept is that you go out on a date once every two weeks at a minimum with your spouse. And the rule is you can't talk about work or the kids. You just talk about your relationship. And if you met 26 times a year and talked about your relationship, you wouldn't go home someday and there's a moving van moving the furniture out, you know, and you're saying, you never mentioned it, you know. And, uh, and you know, it, it really is. It's that, that intentionality, you know. It's the same way with your kids. You want to do something with the kids as a group, but do some one-on-one -on -one stuff with each kid. And, and let me add one dimension to that as well. People talk a lot about um, coaches in many, I was talking to a very large retailer this morning, and um, apparently the word coaching is a horrible punitive word at the company. Hmm. Um, in other words, anybody who got coaching was on the way out the company. So they have now have this mindset where if you are assigned a coach, then you're basically you know, ready to do your severance package. Yes. Um, whereas if you look at you know, how, any of us in this room that may be sports fans, every great athlete has a coach. In fact, every great athlete has many coaches. Mm -hmm. And I always bring that back to even, um, not only in the workplace where we all need coaches, and in this case, you're finding that, that mentoring and that coaching and that feedback in among your peer group, not necessarily among your manager, but in your marriages. I mean, people think that Marriage counseling is only for those who are on the way out of the relationship. Why not have somebody, if you want to be a great spousal athlete, then why not have a coach? You know what we're doing for our friends, our kids' friends when they get married? Our present is a weekend with uh, the fellow up in Seattle 
uh, on mar who does marriage coaching. That, that's, the, that's our gift to them. Well, didn't the Catholic Church mandate yeah. that for, for years? You wouldn't be able to get married from the priest unless the priest went through, and, I, and I'm sure many religions have recognized this power, and we've lost that as we've, as we've moved into today, that we all need outside that kind of advice and that kind of feedback. And the thing is that it is richly available sitting around us. Yeah. And that's yeah. what this book unleashes, which is so powerful. Yeah, and my wife Marge and I, on tomorrow, we celebrate our 55th wedding anniversary. And, uh, but uh, we've, gotten, we've gone to coaching and counseling periodically over the, the years, you know, because I want to tell you, if you don't have issues in your relationship, you lie about other things too. Uh, and, uh, you know, and so, uh, so you, you know, just living with somebody else and their, their personalities and needs, it's a wonderful opportunity to learn, but you need to open yourself up, up to it, you know, and rather so than... So can, can you have earned the permission, given your prestige and, and eminence, to talk about some of these softer topics as fluidly as you do and people listen? Um, many of us, if we're trying to go back into our grizzled organizations to introduce these principles, may not have the same permission. Um, as a result, what I tend to do is I tend to go with what do these things create? And one of the great things about these kind of relationships is that they create the, the capacity for candor. And they create the capacity for accountability. No business person will shy away from the recognition that candor and accountability are important. But these relationships build the psychological safety underneath which you're allowed candor and accountability. I want to talk a little bit about the candor piece. Um, it's conflict avoidance is so ripe in organizations. Yes. Um, what advice do you have for people offering candor that uh, may or may not be well received? In, in the case earlier, you talked about building the relationship first, which is that psychological safety. But yeah, I think you need that. Even when you have it, it's sometimes yeah, a delicate it's hard, subject. Yeah. And I tell people, my, one of my favorite sayings is, when in doubt, confront, and when all else fails, try honesty. You know, and uh, that uh, you're not doing somebody else a favor by not sharing with them uh, things that they ought to learn, you know. But I think you need your operant, wrap your arm around them and say, you know, I love and care for you. But yeah. I also ask permission. Do you mind if I share something I think that I've been observing that might be helpful. And they might say, not today, <laughs> you, know, you know, or whatever. But you know, I think it, it's, you kind of ask permission almost rather than charge in, you know, but you know how I care about it. I, here's something I, I think might be interesting for, for you to, to hear. Uh, and because if you care about somebody enough, uh, why wouldn't you want them to be the best that they can be? And then if you do that, they're gonna help you uh, do that, you know. I mean, one of the things uh, that I've had to learn, uh, and I'm still learning, is is to listen more. You know, my wife is a great listener, you know, and but sometimes she'll say, "Would you keep quiet for a minute? Do you mind if I share something?" And and she's always right. You know, that's what I really hate. Uh, and uh, but I, I think it, it it's that wonderful. Uh, give and take of, of uh, do you care enough about each other? And that's what's a, wonderful about a mentoring relationship over time is that, you know, if you're talking about who's covering your back, yeah. you know, there's, there's somebody there f for you uh, to cheer you on and to also, you know, help you uh, do. You know, I, I always mentioned to, to Keith, if, if somebody said to me, Blanchard, I'm taking every concept you've ever taught for the last 45 years away, but one thing, what would you hold on to? And I think it's the second secret of the one minute manager, which is if you want to have great relationship with people, you ought to catch them doing something right and Praise. accept the positive. Celebration. You know? And you know, just take marriage. When people first fall in love, everything's great. You go, oh, God. You know? And your friends might say, oh, I'm not sure she's right. Oh, God. You know? And then, <laughs> And then you move in with him, you say, what the hell is that? <laughs> Shit, you gotta be kidding me, you know? And all of a sudden, you're accenting the negative and wondering why somebody doesn't wanna come home. Well, if you wanna turn a relationship around, what, how can you start to catch them doing something right and accent the positive? Because then you have the relationship to- Why is that so people. difficult for so many leaders? 
It, it, it really is, uh, you know, it's an interesting question because they, uh, they just get in, it's a lousy habit. Well, you know, it's interesting. I, I, was, I was talking to uh, a team the other day, and one of the leaders, a little bit more self-aware than most, who is terrible at this, at being celebratory, um, said, well, heck, I just treat everybody like I treat myself. Yeah. And that's the sadness of which it. Is which really is really true. <laughs> which if they, you know, in so many big businesses, to get to the top, you had to be a grueling, yeah. self, you know, flagellating sort of individual who just yeah. pushed yourself, pushed yourself, nothing was ever good enough, a perfectionist, and then guess how you're going to treat the people around you. Yeah. Um, and that's a difficult habit to break. Yeah. Let me uh, try something with you. This is a, one of the best exercises you can do every day. Put your right hand on your left shoulder, your left hand on your right shoulder, and give yourself a hug, you know, <laughs> uh, because you are fabulous, you know, and if you're not for yourself, who By the is? Way, only Ken Wilson <clears throat> can get away with doing that, so. No, but, I mean, really, I mean, if you're not yeah. for yourself, who is? Well, but I loved your, your comment earlier, some of the basic lessons, and one of them is that uh, God doesn't make junk. That's right. So if you wake up every day and recognize that, um, uh, that you are lovable and you, you are extraordinary and you need to find that in yourself uh, to be able to share it with others. Well, that, um, that gets to something else that you and I were talking about, which is the, the power of humility. You know, if you have read Jim Collins' book, Good to Great, he said the two characteristics of great leaders was resolve, which is, is determination to accomplish a goal, live according to vision, and the second one was humility. And when that first came out, Jim said to his researchers, go look at that data. How could humility be the second most powerful trait of a great leader? And they kept on coming back and said, Jim, that's the data. And see, because people think that people with humility are somehow weak. And Norman Vincent Peale and I had a saying in our book uh, that people with humility don't think less of themselves. They just think about themselves less. See, and, be, and, and the people who are really humble are people who are comfortable with themselves. You know, and, and we see some of this on the national level, you know, this stimulus response attitude to, to stuff. It's people who don't feel good about themselves and they gotta strike out at anybody who says anything against them, where if they were really comfortable with who they are, they would say, gee, that's interesting. Could you tell me more? Yeah. You know, you know, is there anything else I should, should be learning? And that's not weakness, that's coming from okayness. And so that, that the first thing in the morning is to, to do this and say, thank you, God, you know, because I know you didn't make any junk. And how can I live today in a way that glorifies your name and, and makes me be the kind of person that you'd want to be? I mean, I think it's a really... Powerful goal. Um, uh, before we go, by the way, start thinking of your questions. We're going to come to you right after this. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the teams that I've seen. They get into these pockets, these cycles of resistance and, all, and resentment. And people can stew in resentment with another individual for a long time. In fact, that could be the, the stasis of a relationship could be resentment, and that's a, quote, functional relationship. People work together all the time, and they're resentful of each other. Um, can you speak a little bit about getting out of that, out of that cycle? Because one of the things I love about this book is this gives you an abundance of opportunities to practice being the kind of human you should be everywhere. So it's like a friend of mine once said, um, the reason bartenders hear all the truth is because it's safe. But it's, <laughs> the, it's the relationships you're with every day that could you practice this in your team? Did you practice this with your boss, not just with a mentor? Yes. But when you get stuck yeah. in a relationship, how do you begin to get unstuck or get other people unstuck or find that forgiveness and, and find the way out of the resentment cycle? Well, again, it's your, it's your mindset. And I had a, a great mother who said to me, uh, Ken, don't ever act like you're better than anybody else, but don't let them act like they're better than you. She said, there's a pearl of goodness in every human being. Dig for it. Now, some people, you've got to dig a little deeper uh, and all. And so uh, I think you have to have an attitude of realizing, boy, I'm really ticked off at this person. I don't think I've found the pearl yet. Yeah. And uh, where could I find that, that pearl? And, and uh, you know, try to find some people who have a good relationship with them. And what, 
what is it that attracts you to this person? Yeah, right? I often find that's what? great. You, you run around finding something. Why in the world do you like that person? Yeah. Teach me, right? Yeah, no, exactly. it's, it really it is. And, and uh, because I, I think of that philosophy is that, that, that there's, a, there's a pearl of, of goodness there. And it's, uh, and it's the other big thing is to realize that it's not about you. Mm. You know, I, I think we've been put here to serve, not to be served. And it takes you a while to, to recognize uh, that. And uh, we don't have time to talk about it now, but I was telling Keith, I have a 12-step Egos Anonymous program now because uh, I think the, the biggest addiction in the world is the human ego, and there's two aspects of that. One is false pride when you have a more than philosophy. You say, I'm brighter than you know, these stupid idiots, you know. And the other one, which a lot of people don't think is an ego problem, is fear or self-doubt yeah. when you have a less than philosophy. Oh, God, I don't know if I have what it takes and all that kind of thing. And to overcome false pride is you need humility and to overcome fear and self-doubt, you got to trust the unconditional love of God. Yeah. Uh, that well, I, God didn't I would, make any jump. And, and I would say that both of them are the latter. Yeah. Most of the people that I've met with great ego yeah. are deeply insecure. That's right. And it's really, the, I, I would say that the greatest, and this is why, by the way, there is a 12-step program that you could go to probably within an hour of now within 100 yards from here called Al Anon. Al-Anon is not, is for those, it's basically 12 steps for the rest of us. Um, it's for those of you who are addicted to being perfect and to controlling other people and their behaviors, um, independent of addictions. And so you literally, you should try it. Um, walk in and just say, you know, I'm in a relationship with somebody who I can't let go of what they're doing. Um, so that's something to think about. So let's go to the, let's go to the audience with some, some questions, please. <laughs> it's all right, go ahead. I actually have two questions. <laughs> Yeah. Um, one is, since you're talking about vulnerability, what keeps you up at night? That's an EO question. I believe it's about the EO. Yeah. What keeps you guys up at night? And secondly, as a mentor, is it good to be both a mentor and a mentee at the same time? Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so what keeps us up at night, and is it good to be a mentor and a mentee at the same time? Well, what keeps me up at night is, uh, is what's happening around the world. Uh, I just, uh, you know, take about faith. I, I just wish people, if I was going to have a, a, a wish, is that people would give up being right, particularly about their faith. Uh, and why do we have to be right about things? And, and if, uh, uh, if we could come with an attitude of love, and I just worry about people who were willing to blow themselves up to kill other people, and, and you know, where do they get to that? I mean, it just doesn't, and, uh, you know, boy, if, if, if so that keeps, how, how can we spread love around the world rather than hate and all that kind of, uh, of thing? And that, that keeps me, me up. And is it important to be a mentor and a mentee at the same time? I, I think it's, it's great to, 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 to think about both of those. Is there somebody that maybe you could help in the process you'll get help, but is there, some stuff that you could learn, you know, uh, and, and be mentored on. Uh, so that, that's just, uh, is, is there some people around here that, that could really help you? And I'm, I'm always uh, looking for new, new mentors to, to help me in the, in, the, in the rest of my life, particularly I, and I see older people who are so excited about, about life. You know, and, and uh, I think we're sitting uh, in front of one. Yeah, <laughs> that's uh, it. Really is uh, fun, but there's a there's a lot of a uh, lot of excitement. Like one person I admire so much is Frances Hesselbaum. Uh, she ran the Girl Scouts. The Girl Scouts. She's 101 years old now, and I she think she's going to be there this weekend. I know, I'm sure she will. She's With, a good friend uh, of Marshall, Marshall Goldsmith. Goldsmith. Yeah, I tell you, Marshall was interviewing her recently. She's done all kinds. She ran the Drucker Institute and all. He said, uh, Francis, what has been the key to your success over your life? Here you are in, in your hundreds. And she said, I think it's my blood type. <laughs> and he said, what's that? She said, be positive. <laughs> Isn't that a, w a wonderful line? I just, I you know, and so, uh, you know, I, when I see Francis, I just go, whoa, you know, here's somebody that I can learn from. I'm just a kid. On a, on a personal basis, on the um, uh, what keeps me up at night, 
it's, it's sitting in front of somebody like Ken and just being awestruck with the kind of ripple effects that, that one man can have and asking the question humbly, you know, if I've been put on this planet to make a difference, how do I do so with a maximum impact? And um, you know, just constantly humbled by mm -hmm. people like Ken who I couldn't ever possibly approach the ripple effects. So um, trying to figure out how to, how to be of service. You've got a lot of years left to get to the ripple. I hope so. Thank you. <laughs> well, and, and a lot of learning to do. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Blanchard, and uh, thank you for coming, and thanks for uh, presenting this with Live Talk, uh, Keith, and, and to your staff. Or, um, I'm a pastor. I wanted to uh, ask, one, who are your mentors, and who have they been over the course of your life? Uh, and then how does this... I, I used to attend Drucker, and I, heard under, I understood that you had a great relationship with uh, Peter Drucker, and I wanted to know... Um, how do you extrapolate some of this to sort of a church or nonprofit setting, um, particularly a church? But yeah. uh, I'd, I'd like to hear how, how you might think that would work in my setting. Well, you know, it's interesting. I, I uh, was a latecomer to my faith, you know, because I, I saw a lot of hypocrisy when I was young with people who would talk about their faith and not behave that way, you know. And so my wife and I... Uh, really kind of backed away. And then when the one-minute manager came out, I was on the Hour of Power with Robert uh, Shula in his heyday. And he said, Ken, I love the one-minute manager, but you know who's the greatest one-minute manager of all time? I said, who's that? He said, Jesus. I said, really? He said, yeah, he was really clear on goals. Isn't that your first secret? One minute, yeah. And he said, you and Tom Peters didn't invent management by wandering around. Jesus did. He wandered from one little village. To if anybody showed any interest, he'd praise him, heal him. And now you're second secret. Wonder, yeah. And he said, and if people stepped out of line, he wasn't afraid to give him a one-minute reprimand. He threw the money lenders out of the temple. And so I went to the Gospels, and I was just blown away because everything I had ever taught about leadership, Jesus did. And he did it with these 12 incompetent guys he hired. I mean, you wouldn't... <laughs> I mean, really, you wouldn't have hired that lot. And, uh, you know, I was doing a program with John Ortberg, who's one of my favorite pastors and friends and on Lead Like Jesus, we have a ministry all over the world. And, uh, and I said, John, why would you fly to Atlanta from California and tell people Jesus is the greatest leadership role model of all time? You know, John is, he's just such a, he said, well, let me just ask you a question. Suppose you were a gambler 20, you know, several thousand years ago. Where would you bet your money on lasting, the Roman Empire and the Roman army, or a little Jewish rabbi with 12 inexperienced followers? He said, isn't it interesting that 2,100 years later, we're still naming kids, say, Jesus, Peter, Paul, and Mary, and we name our dogs Nero and Caesar. And, uh, <laughs> he, uh, and he said, I rest my case, you know. So, uh, so uh, he's been a great mentor of, of mine, besides my, my parents and people like Norman Vincent Peale. I wrote a book with Truett Cathy, the founder of Chick-fil-A. What an amazing guy, called The Generosity Factor, you know, because... I think that's such an important thing in life. You know, a lot of people think there's, what's, what su makes them successful is how much money they make and how much recognition they get and their power stays. That's all fine, but that's about success. Significance is your generosity of your time, your talent, your treasure. And Truett and I added a fourth one, touch, reaching out to people. What's the opposite of, of, of recognition service? And what's the opposite of power the status is loving relationships, which, you know, I, I know you're so much in. And if you want to all read a great book, read Ortberg's book. At the end of the game, it all goes back in the box. Yeah. Uh, it's wonderful because he talks about it. He and his grandmother, uh, when he was young, they would play Monopoly. Any of you ever play Monopoly? She was a vicious Monopoly player. He said, in fact, when she played Monopoly, she acted like she was the illegitimate child of a, an affair between Donald Trump and Martha Stewart. But, uh, and, uh, but uh, she said at the end, she had everything, Park Place, Broadway, and she would smile and say, John, someday you're going to learn how to play the game. And when he was about 13 or 14, a kid moved next door. He was a credible Monopoly player, and he practiced with the kid every, summer, every day in the summer because he knew his grandmother was coming in September. When she came, he ran to the house, gave her a hug. Grandma, how about a Monopoly game? Her eyes lit up, let's go, John but he was ready for her this time. And he came out of the chute and he just wiped his grandmother out. He had everything at the end. 
And she, she smiled and she said, John, now that you know how to play the game, let me teach you a lesson about life. He said, what's that? She said, it all goes back in the box. Mm. She said, the only thing you get to save is your soul. And that's where you store who you love and who loves you. And I, I love the ending of Ghost, if you've ever seen that movie. Patrick Swayze plays this guy, Sam, who's a financial advisor and, and uh, gets killed by a friend. And he gets to stay on, on Earth as a ghost to, to protect his girlfriend, Molly, played by Demi Moore. And he gets to talk to her through Whoopi Goldberg, who plays this, you know, my, my religious people don't like because she's a clairvoyant. I say, oh, she's full of love. You know, get a life. Uh, and... Uh, uh, and at the end of the movie, he's avenged his death, and the three of them are the, are the roof of Molly's building, and this white light comes towards him. And he looks at Oda May, and he says, your mama would have been proud of you, you know? And then he turns to Molly, and if you saw the movie, he never told Molly he loved her. Uh, she would say, Sam, I love you, and what would he say? Ditto. And now, with tears coming down his eyes, he says, Molly, I love you, I've always loved you, and and she's crying, and she says, ditto, you know. And then he turns to face the life and light, and he stops one last time. And he says, Molly, the remarkable thing about this is you can take the love with you. And you're not taking one other thing out of this world but that love and that relationship. And that's why you and I are such compadres in uh, that. I am... Um... I've been told we have one or two more questions, but I don't want to after that, <laughs> but I will, for your sake. Um, let me just add one, one thing very quick on that. Uh, I often take the religious analogy back into companies. You have to be somewhat cautious on how you address it, but my view is one leader did not create the institution called faith on a, you know, in the world today. It was the 12 that went out. And so the question is a leader of an organization trying to go do transformation how are you igniting acolytes? How are you creating evangelists? And today, the only thing that grows that faith, that organization, that mission, is the individual down on the, the 10 in La Brea. And that's a, one individual who is working that community. And so we've got to make sure that we're igniting and acolyting the people in the movements. You know, obviously, that, that particular movement has a little help from on high, but the, the movements that we're all trying to create in this world, it's not about control. It's about letting go That's right, and, yeah. and bringing it. So this young man right here. Hi. Uh, my, name is An my name is Andres Engels. And uh, my question... How do I say that again? Andres Engels. Andreas. Yes. yes. Thank you. I, can't, I won't do it as eloquently as you just did. <laughs> Andres. My question is, how do you select your mentees and what do you look for in one? Mm. Well, how you select a mentee is, again, I, I guess back to first the essence Thing. But the, the second question is, uh, do I have any experience that might be helpful to the person? You know, because you want to first, in the essence, find out about who they are and what they're doing, and then if you do the M, the mission, you know, what would what would that person like to get out of a mentoring relationship? Yeah, I, I think at first they select you, in that um, the most natural mentees are the ones that you know are stalkers, um, in the most beautiful way. Uh, there's there's a <laughs> young man who's like a little brother of mine who I've written about in a couple of my books, who, you know, people will come up to me and say, I'd like you to be my mentor. I mean, that's like walking up to somebody in a bar and say, would you marry me? Yeah. You don't even know this person yet. So how would you possibly acquiesce to being a mentor to this person? But the person who's leading with heart, leading with generosity, leading with gratitude, all of that is just overwhelming to you and you want to spend more time with that person, that tends to be my mentees. Now, the flip side is, any great leader needs to be the mentor of everyone in their company. You know, and I, I look at a few folks here at, at my, from my own firm, and independent of their recognition that they need to earn me as a mentor, my job is to be the best, best mentor to them. And that's just the contract that we have. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, I feel like it's a, you know, if, if there's a situational basis, and then those who aren't situational, I would say it's about their passion and their love and their heart. Are they reaching out to you with that level of generosity? Are they knocking on your door and paying you back and telling them how much they're learning from you, et cetera? You know, Keith, one comment in relation to that. Some people say, why would you call the book One Minute Mentoring? Uh, because what we have found is that when you ask people what's the most powerful learning they have, it's usually in a conversation or anything. A lot of people don't want to be mentors because I don't want to take the time. 
Well, it might just be a luncheon, or it just might be a casual conversation yeah. and all. It doesn't have to be something that goes on. Not to say that it's not helpful to have somebody Good that mentors you over time, but uh, it's just, are you open to give and receive advice, maybe that, or yeah. give and receive learnings? Yeah. One last question, the gentleman behind you, I think. Yeah, sorry. Yes, uh, John Holborn, thank you. Uh, looking at situational leadership model and the uh, readiness level three, yeah. where the individual is uh, willing but unable, uh, often I'm finding that the people that I contact and work with to mentor, they, they come to a place where they're willing, uh, I should say they're, they're able to enter into that relationship, but there's an unwillingness, particularly perhaps in people that would be 30 years my junior. Can you talk a little bit about working with millennials? Well, I, I, about 25 or 30 percent of our company are millennials, and they're fabulous because when when I grew up, I remember a friend of mine got a job, you know, with AT and T when we graduated from Cornell. He called home and his mother cried and said, "You got a job for life." I mean, because when I grew up, you went with one company and you stayed for 35, 40 years, and they gave you a watch and. You know, the whole thing. Pension and but the, the great thing about millennials, they aren't there for a career necessarily, and therefore they're very honest. Uh, and uh, I, I think they're just great. I mean, they're the ones, that if, if we're inconsistent with what we say we believe, they're the first ones to say can, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And uh, so, so they're, they're really fabulous. And, uh, but they also are open to learn, too, if you'll reach out to them. But because, but, see, they like leadership in a side-by-side -side relationship, not top-down. And so, like, we rewrote the one-minute manager. It's called, you know, the new one-minute manager. And uh, uh, one of the major changes we call one-minute reprimand now, one-minute redirects, which is much different than kind of this reprimand uh, kind of, of thing. And so I, I just think it's uh, just a different approach to leadership, which is, uh, they want to be partners in leadership. They don't want your job, yeah. but they also want recognition that maybe they bring something to the party. I ri my, my small riff on millennials is, um, you know, we all talk about millennials. How dare them demand that in the workplace they have passion and purpose? How, how dare them want, like, coaching and attention? You know, the rest <laughs> of us gave that up a long time ago. Um, <laughs> And I think the bottom line is the millennial population will bring back into the workplace a set of characteristics that we all wish we hadn't given up on a long time ago. Um, well, listen, you are a blessing both personally and in the world, and I, this will be one of the great moments for me personally um, of my career to be with you here on stage and, uh, and to get to know you a little bit better. Ken, thank you so much for your time today. Well, I, it's been great to see you, and I, I'm anxious to see what you do over the next 25 or 30 years, and I might be watching from above. I think but, you'll be but, here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why not? I mean, Francis uh, uh, handled so. It's, uh, I just think life is uh, fun to, to meet people, and, and uh, I, I look at us uh, maybe doing something together sometime. That would be fun. What a, great, what a great lesson. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, Ken.